hello and welcome to our lecture series climate protection the guest of today uh, gave a, a lecture uh, two years ago also in uh, june 2019 about climate protection wolfgang feist um, is our guest today and uh, he is the founder of the passive house institute in darmstadt um, he made the passive house standard for new construction and renovation well known and available worldwide Feist is a recipient of the German Environmental Award and of the Sustainable Building Award of the University of Lund. And he has been teaching at the University of Innsbruck since 2008 as professor for structural engineering, building physics and building technology. Wolfgang wrote his diploma thesis in quantum mechanics in the town of Tübingen and shortly afterwards changed job and hobby, which is energy consulting primarily um, theoretical. He also brings a fascination for experimental work. And so he did his doctorate at the University of Kassel with the numerical validation of the experimental building, Passive House, Darmstadt, Granichstein. The project plays a key role in the insight that will be placed in a general context in his um, lecture. He will show us now. It's about energy which um, is on physics, industry, application, and efficiency. Welcome, Wolfgang Feist. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, welcome, everybody. And thank you for the introduction, uh, Werner Pfluger. Uh, this lecture will be about energy, how it's perceived in economy, in our society, and in physics. Uh, mainly, I'll be introducing energy services and why energy efficiency is playing the key role for solving the problems uh, we have with that energy right now in the economy. Let me begin with a first example, uh, which is easy to understand for everybody. Uh, well, it's a coffee machine. Uh, let's look at that coffee machine in a different wavelength. That's the wavelength of the thermal radiation, heat radiation. And there we can see, well, not surprising, the coffee is hot, uh, but you also can realize that a lot of the thermal energy is getting lost uh, to the air, to the environment here. So after a few minutes, the coffee will be not as hot. So what do we do? Well, clever engineering, uh, we just provide that energy losses again to keep the energy, the internal energy of the coffee as it is. This is an active process to provide energy to keep it hot. But there's also another way to do this. And we all know, we all have seen that already. We can use a thermos bottle, fill the coffee into the thermos bottle. There's still some losses. You see that the thermos bottle is still on the surface a little bit hotter than the environment. So there are still some losses, but these losses are so low that we can keep the coffee hot almost passively. So there is almost no energy, little bit of energy that would be needed, but we don't provide it because after a few hours, it's coffee still hot, but uh, we will not drink coffee after a few hours. So it's it's doing it's doing the energy service completely in a passive way now you might say uh interesting thing or just a little bit talking from the aspect of physics about something we all know but that's the surprising thing the surprising thing is that almost all contemporary energy use is just of this kind it's just resubstituting for the losses we create. Energy use is mainly just creating losses. There's a provoking uh, thesis, but uh, after this presentation, it's all about it, you'll realize that that is true. Now, let's begin with energy in an industrial society like ours, uh, where the main thing is all about energy carriers. So if you look into the discussion we have now, we are discussing energy carriers oil, natural gas, and might be hot engine, electricity, wood. All these energy carriers are tradable goods. So there are providers. Uh, 
we call these providers the energy sector, the supply side. And that's how most people think about when we think about energy. The energy sector delivers the energy carriers to the consumers, like we are delivering apples and bread. And it plays a very important role in our contemporary economy. And a role this it can't be changed very fast, but it will have to be changed. And we will see how it can be changed. And then there are these final consumers. Uh, the final consumer, the end consumer, he buys the energy carriers and consumes them. So after that, the oil is gone, obviously. The electricity is gone, obvious. So it's been con and we will have a deeper look into what that means to consume these energy. Hi. Now let's have a look into energy in physics. And that will be uh, the rest of the presentation. We'll just look at energy from a point of view from a physicist. Now you see that energy is a basic physical concept. It's very interesting because it might be the most important physical concept. So you could talk of physics as the science of energy. So if you want to know something about energy, best way would always be to ask a physicist because he knows best, yeah? because physics is the science of energy. If we look into that concept and we will learn about that concept, we will realize that efficiency, energy efficiency, is the most important tool in this respect. And that we can deal with energy efficiency. As we dealt with energy carriers, energy efficiency is the alternative to energy carriers. And this will lead us to energy in a knowledge-based society. And it will show us that it will be possible in the future to increase the efficiency in a way that there is no problem to provide all the energy on the natural energy flow we can get from nature. So we'll see that in the presentation. So let's start with the energy concept in physics. And uh, I just want to give you an abstract definition. Energy in classical physics is the potential to generate work from a system. Now, now I would have to define work. Most of us has, uh, have some impressions of what work is. So let's leave it with that. And I'll also come back to it in one of the next slides. So this energy can come in different kinds, like kinetic energy. What you see here is a meteorite or also a uh, spacecraft, which is uh, coming back from outer space with a lot of kinetic energy. And uh, now it's, of course, uh, converted that energy into uh, heat energy, which is almost uh, the final situation for almost all energy flows. Uh, another kind of energy is uh, electricity, as you see here. So using energy corresponds to the potential for transformations which can be achieved. So if you want to change something on the planet or anywhere, we can use energy uh, to do that transformation. The faster you supply the energy, the huger the transformation will be. Uh, if you have a very fast energy conversion, like in this type, we call it an explosion, and it will change everything in a fraction of a second. So energy is somehow the tool which it makes us mighty, mighty against nature and mighty against other humans on uh, the planet. This is one of the reasons why energy also played a major role always in politics, and we can realize this right now again. Now let's have a deeper look into how energy is quantified and how big the energy is we use in contemporary uh, daily life. And uh, this is a very simple process which is uh, illustrating the whole concept of potential energy. Uh, they may be carry the piano uh, from the ground floor into the second floor. Now the piano 
is standing on the ground floor, just sitting there, because there is a force from planet Earth which is keeping the piano at that place. This is called um, the weight of the piano, and we calculated by uh, uh, multiplying the mass of the piano by uh, Earth's gravitational specific force. And that gives us a, a force of uh, somewhat 735 kilogram meter per second square, which we also call Newton. Um, uh, now, if you want to move the piano up to the second floor, we first have to provide a counterforce. That is the force we will work on. Uh, so we have to lift the piano from the ground, and that needs a force in the opposite direction, which we have to provide as the one uh, bringing it up to the second floor. And then we bring it up two times 2.8 meters, uh, and the energy we need for that is just proportional uh, to the height uh, we bring the piano. So if we multiply the force with that half, half times force, we get 4,120 joule. Joule is kilogram meter per uh, meter square per second square. That's the unit for energy, and it's named after the guy who first introduced the concept to physics, and that was joule. Interestingly, it's not so long ago. So most time, whole uh, human society didn't know about energy, uh, just was ignorant about it, had a lot of very strange concepts, what's going on there. Only some 200 years ago, we knew about energy. And uh, this is uh, the correct concept here uh, to use here. Now the question is, now it's up to the second floor, now the question is, is that a lot of energy or is it a small amount of energy? Well, uh, if you have been in some of my lectures, you already will know this is a very dumb question. Uh, because if you ask if something is small or something is big, uh, you always have to have a reference to to um, uh, compare to. Uh, now, if I compare it with my contemporary daily experience, it is a lot of energy. Because if I would have to do this, uh, I have to take a lot of breakfast uh, to be able to provide that service, bringing the, uh, the uh, piano up uh, to the second floor. Let us look at another example. The other example is heating of a building. This is, uh, everybody will agree, uh, a question of energy. And a lot of people are, are now afraid that we might not be able to do that in the next winter because there might be shortage of energy supply. Now, one way to do it is we burn 3,000 liters of heating oil, which is a typical amount of uh, energy carrier used for heating a building. Not the worst uh, situation, but a typical, typical average situation for existing buildings, existing one family homes, for example. So now a value which is quite convenient to know is that one liter of heating oil is approximately uh, 10 kilowatt hours. So the 10 kilowatt hours, uh, is, uh, these are 10 times kilo is 1000. Uh, times 3,600 seconds, um, because a, a, uh, an hour has 3,600 seconds, that gives us 36 million joule. One liter, one liter oil, 36 million joule. So the heating demand of that single family home with 3,000 liters of oil, that will sum up to 108 billion joule, 108 billion joule we use for heating uh, the building. And that means that this is 26.2 million times the energy we need for the transport of a piano to the second floor. It was quite important that I used this example here just to show you that the amount of energy we are using in contemporary times for our services, like keeping our buildings um, at a comfortable temperature, that this amount is very, very high. It's not comparable to the energy we produce as a human being or, or our horses had produced or whatever. It's millions times of that. So this is one of the advantages of the modern society. We came to that development that we now are able to handle 
millions times of energy of what we normally are able as a human being uh, to provide. Now let's come back again uh, to with physics. Um, I've already mentioned that there are a lot of different kinds of energy. Mechanical energy of position, which is mostly gravitational energy. We have already seen that and it can be used in a technical way uh, using these hydropower plants. Then there is the mechanical kinetic energy. We have already also seen that, uh, like in rockets, like in a fast driving car. We have mechanical elastic energy, like in a spring. Uh, uh, the old clocks, they had these springs to store energy. There is electrostatic energy, which can be stored in a capacitor, for example. There is magnetic energy, the energy of electromagnetic waves, like uh, light. There's energy of mass and so on. I won't go on and explaining all of this. Um, uh, the important thing here is, from a point of physics, that we can convert one kind of energy into another kind of energy. For example, we can convert potential energy into kinetic energy. Potential energy, energy for example, if I let something uh, loose, uh, if it falls down to the floor, uh, shortly before it hits the floor, it has a lot of kinetic energy. So all the potential energy will be um, transformed into kinetic energy. Now, um, as a physicist, I would like to show you how we can uh, derive that the formula a half mass uh, velocity squared is exactly the kinetic energy of a uh, of a body. Uh, but I won't do that now. Uh, if you are interested in that, you can look some other videos uh, which are already there, which uh, have been provided from the uh, general courses on uh, general physics. Um, now there is that law of energy conservation, mechanical law of energy conservation. It says that the total mechanical energy is the sum of the potential energy and the kinetic energy, and that that energy is always the same, constant in time. And now you might say, no, that's not true. I have seen it. This is not true. And, 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 and exactly, you are, you are right. It is not true because there are other kinds of energy. So we have to include also these other kinds of energy to get a, a, a real law for energy conservation. Uh, that is generally true for a closed system. If I have a closed system, then the total energy, which is the sum of all the energy in that system, potential energy, kinetic energy, electrical energy, nuclear energy, thermal energy, and all the energy is not being known so far, all of them together in the sum, that will be constant in a closed system. So the closed system is important here. So we have to look into this concept of closed system, a concept which has been used in physics, in engineering, uh, in all of uh, natural science. In a closed system, you have that law of energy conservation. The closed system is a system which has a system boundary. Well, all systems have system boundaries, um, so we draw that system boundary. Now, the special thing with the closed system is that nothing goes in, nothing goes on. It's really closed. No energy transferred through the boundary, which people who know can say is almost impossible. You have always some little bit of energy going through the boundary. Uh, but for a concept, for a theoretical tense, a concept, it's quite interesting to, to have that concept of a closed uh, system. Then in that closed system, this is where the law of energy conservation is, uh, is uh, um, uh, working. Total amount of energy in a closed system is constant. Now let's look into an open system. In an open system, uh, we still have that boundary we still can draw a boundary but the boundary isn't completely close so there might be some energy transgressing the boundary uh, so that energy which transgresses the boundary we can call losses and this is something where uh, all engineers agree 
But there might be some very clever physicists who say, well, we just have flown. There are no energy losses. All energy is conserved. Uh, yes, the energy is still there, but it's no longer within my system. It's outside my system. This is as if you are throwing your money out of the window. The money is not gone, but it's gone for you. It's a loss for you. And this is the concept of energy losses used in engineering. It's a completely correct concept. So there are energy losses. Energy losses are defined by the energy which is transgressing the boundary. And with that concept in mind, we can look uh, into uh, the energy law if it's been formulated for such an open system. And that means that the total energy at the end of a process is the total energy at the start of the process minus the losses, minus the energy which is transgressing the boundary. Now, let's go further on and let's look at an example. Uh, I'm looking for an example from daily life, so it's easy to understand. Uh, we have already seen heating plays a major role. Uh, it's about one third of all the energy we use nowadays is just used for heating our buildings, for making the buildings comfortable uh, each uh, winter. So the heating energy is coming from an oil tank, from tank truck or something like that. It's uh, delivered to the building. So now it's in the system. So this is energy delivery to uh, the system. Now we generate the heat from uh, the oil. Uh, this is an energy conversion process converting uh, the energy in a furnace uh, by burning it um, the, the oil is gone after that uh, it will be completely changed into other chemical substances like carbon dioxide or uh, water vapor uh, which is then got lost through the chimney yeah. uh, and with this chimney loss we also have a amount of energy which is leaving the system. Uh, first part of the losses we have here, and only a part of that energy is transformed to energy we can use, output energy, heat, the heated water or the heated air. Now, in engineering, uh, you often call these energy on the right-hand side, we use energy or useful energy. And it's the useful energy for that specific step, for that step of uh, conversion. And we can calculate an efficiency factor for that. The efficiency factor is just the output energy, the transformed energy, the still useful energy, uh, divided by the delivered energy. So that factor is always smaller than one. And the rest of this, that's already energy losses. This is energy which we just deliver to the atmosphere or to the river or wherever, where we don't use it any longer. So this is what we do with the energy which is provided. Now, uh, it's even uh, a bit more complicated. That is, uh, we have a primary energy source. In our situation, that would be somebody drilling for oil. Uh, when we have the input and we have the first system uh, like like a, a cleaning column and um, where we where we have some uh, some changing of of the energy uh, kind uh, already some losses and an output number one with an efficiency number one and we deliver it to a system number two this might be the truck or the pipeline we need some energy to transport uh, the amount of oil here. And uh, this, of course, is also energy which is lost from the process. So we have, uh, again, a smaller amount of energy with another efficiency uh, to the system. Then we have system number three. That might be our furnace. And uh, when we get, now this is uh, where uh, most of the time people stop thinking, uh, when we get that useful energy, the heat for heating, uh, the building. Now, if we want to look into the overall efficiency of that chain, it's very easy to see uh, the efficiency of that chain is just the product of all these efficiencies. Uh, and we end, we end up with some 35 to 
50% of energy efficiency using uh, this calculation for the energy flow in the energy flow chain. But uh, what I want to do now is I want to concentrate on this last step, the so-called useful energy. Let's have a look what's happening here. It's quite interesting from a physical point of view because this is energy which we provide to the building. What is at the end left from that energy inside of the building? Not, not just now, but let's think what is left of the heating energy you provided to your building last year, last year in December. Is any of that energy left in the building right now? Huh. No, not at all. It's all gone. It's all losses. This was a surprising thing. It's all being provided to the environment through the windows, through the walls, uh, through ventilation. We have created an energy surface. The surface is that it's a comfortable temperature inside of the building, but the energy we use for that is all lost to the outside. So the end use, the final use of energy is at the end a complete loss of that energy flow to the environment. Let's look at this last step a little bit closer. Um, so this is the energy services part, the energy service system. Energy service system in this respect, in this example, is the building. And we call that in engineering useful energy, useful heating energy, but uh, as we see, uh, it will be converted by the use system, that's the building, into energy flows which go through a wall, through a window, uh, through the roof to the outside. All losses, all energy will at the end be in the atmosphere and will be in this way given up from planet Earth uh, at the end uh, in, into space, into the cosmos. So what is at the end uh, the result? Well, the energy services we provide here, they are not of type energy. They are not the kind of energy. So that is uh, one of the important things to realize. That the services we really need, what we really want to have, is not energy. What we want to have is a service. What Now, what is the service here? Let's look uh, at the service in the example of space heating the energy service. So what is what, what do we want? Well, we want thermal comfort in the building. Now, what is uh, thermal comfort? Now, uh, easily speaking, we want a temperature where we feel comfortable. So rawly, it's a temperature in between 20 and 24 degrees where uh, human beings uh, with a contemporary clothing feel comfortable. We want it within an area, living space, say uh, area A, uh, uh, living space. And of course, the, the energy uh, service will be bigger the huger this living space is. So we already see why we, we needed much more energy um, uh, in the past decades than the decades before, because the living area is uh, getting bigger and bigger. So this is something uh, we really gained by uh, using a lot of energy. Now we compare that temperature uh, to the outside temperature and normally in the outside it's cooler than on the inside um, and we do it for a time period. So all of that together gives us a temperature difference from the inside to the outside which is also the driving, driving part for the energy losses. Uh, this difference, uh, this temperature difference, uh, uh, the bigger it gets, uh, the higher the energy service uh, we have to provide. And uh, we have that living area and we have the time we do that. So the service is proportional uh, to all three of that temperature difference, living area and time period. And that gives us a physical dimension of degree, normally um, measured in Kelvin in uh, physics, um, times area measured in square meter and time we measure in hours. Kelvin hours square meter. And that is not the dimension of an energy. 
This is the most important and interesting thing. Now we can look into um, the uh, process a little bit closer. In order to have a comfortable inside, uh, we need a constant temperature inside. And uh, in most of the cases in Central Europe, it's colder outside than inside. Um, so uh, by this, by the second law of physics, uh, with not changing internal energy and higher temperature inside than outside, we get an energy flow from the inside out. How high that flow will be is depending on the quality of the building envelope. But we always have a heat loss from the inside to the outside. Uh, there are transmission heat losses uh, through to heat conduction, through the wall, for example. There are ventilation heat losses, there might be other heat losses. Now the internal energy, if we have had heat losses, the internal energy will be reduced. But well, we can't have that because you want to have a temperature constant. So we have to provide the same amount of energy, which is lost to the outside, we'll have to provide from uh, uh, the outside again. Part of it, we are lucky, is coming with no additional cost. Perhaps with solar for windows, internal sources, like myself, I'm heating the room. Uh, but another part, uh, we have to pay for, that is the fuel, the fuel we burn in the furnace. Yeah, so burning fuel for keeping buildings hot is nothing else. I explicitly say here, again, nothing else than substituting for the losses. Substituting for the heat losses, we have to be outside. So this is why we can improve that. These have to be exactly uh, the same. Let's just look at an example of a newly constructed building. Yeah, a lot of concrete here. Uh, so that is a very highly conducting material. So if we have a warmer temperature inside and outside, you have uh, entry losses uh, through that wall to uh, the outside and you have the windows and so on. So we can look at that energy flow in more detail. This is actually the built balance of an existing building. And here for, you see the energy losses of the wall due to uh, conduction of the roof, of the windows, uh, for the uh, energy transfer done by the ventilation. On the right hand side, you see the energy provided. There's some solar energy, there's some internal heat sources, but most of it is Heating, heating energy. Well, this is for a whole uh, year in a, a building. Now, what we can do, we can reduce these losses by improving the efficiency of the uh, building envelope, by using heat recovery and so on, all these things. So, if we reduce these losses by 73%, this is normal for a good uh, uh, modern building. Um, we also reduce, of course, the total amount of energy which has to be provided to the building. Uh, because the internal loads and the solar energy, the free heat, is the same before and after, we reduce the amount of energy we need for heating even more. So that's up to 86% or even more how far we can reduce that energy. Now, how do we do that? Well, practically, this is what's been done. This is the same building. This is the insulation of the building envelope. This reduces the heat loss of the wall by a factor of 10 or even more. Uh, the, the windows are also very well insulated in, in, in this type of building. And we have a heat recovery system also. So this is reducing the overall demand for heating uh, to a very, very low amount. So the specific energy consumption for heating, uh, it is the energy consumed divided by the energy service. We provide. Now the energy consumed is the heating energy. This is what coming what's coming out of your furnace divided by the energy services. We have seen a few slides ahead. And if we now use the units which are used here, uh, we have the unit of the uh, heating energy that's kilowatt hours, and we divide it by the unit of the energy services that's kilo kelvin hours square meter. We have already seen. Now, some of the variables cancel, the kilo cancels, the hour cancels, and what we are left with is what per square meter Kelvin. Now, some engineers uh, which are uh, in this presentation, they, they might uh, know this uh, unit, 
watts per square meter Kelvin. Yes, it's the unit of a U value. So what we get here is something like the overall U value of the living area, uh, putting together all the losses uh, from that area to the outside, all the losses added through wall, through a window, through ventilation, uh, through the drainage, and so on. All that put together and divided by the energy service gives us uh, the measure for the inefficiency of our building. So the higher this value in watts per square meter Kelvin, the less efficient our, our building is. And this is, of course, a technical thing. We can improve the efficiency of a building. And how do we do it? Well, we have already seen, uh, for example, by insulating or by heat recovery. So insulation, external walls of roofs and so on. Windows, which have solar gain, and also net losses, which are much lower than the solar gains. And the heat recovery ventilation system, which can realize some um, energy loss reduction by a factor five or even ten. I'm not going into details right here now, because you can also see that in the presentations about energy efficiency improvement in existing buildings or in new buildings. Yeah, this, there's a lot of this information available, but I'm now just giving a little bit of a general context uh, for that. This is working in practice. We know. We have the measured energy consumption in that range, 15 kilowatt hours per square meter and year, which means that we only have about 300 liters of, high, of heating oil uh, for heating a, such a building uh, compared to the 3,000 we have seen uh, before. And we can do that also in existing buildings. So this is an existing building before the modernization, before the refurbishment, with a consumption of 200 kilowatt hours per square meter and year, so this is the compensation for the losses of, of the building, fabric of that building. And this is after the measured value, after it has been completed, after we had added the insulation on the external wall, after we have uh, exchanged windows and uh, using the heat recovery in the ventilation system, we're coming down by a factor of seven to 26 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. And we can even see that if we use the thermographic camera again, you have seen in my first slide. Yeah? So this is this building which has been refurbished. Um, almost no energy losses from the wall. You can compare the temperature on the surface with the temperature on the freestanding tree, and you see it's almost the same. It's almost no loss through the wall any longer. A little bit of loss through windows, and if, and if the window is opened, of course, it's uh, even higher. In the background, you see a building which is still not refurbished, and you see how high the energy losses are in these types of buildings. Yeah, well, no surprise, seven times higher than the insulated one. Let's look at a second example. My second example will come from traffic. Uh, just um, uh, to give you an idea, uh, heating buildings is about 30% of the energy, of the final energy consumption in a, a modern society like the German society or also the Austrian society. Using uh, gasoline for traffic uh, going in cars is another 30% of the energy. So we, we, we have the, the two most important uh, parts of uh, why energy is consumed in our societies, uh, we have already dealt with uh, after after that presentation. In Germany, we have driven about 905 billion kilometers. Uh, this is the energy surface in the year 2010. And we have consumed for that, as another unit for energy, 2,586 petajoule. What is, well, not the third, but 28% of the final energy demand in Germany, and approximately uh, 72 billion liters of gasoline. Now, the specific energy demand for that, yeah, the efficiency or the inefficiency of the whole system, that is dividing the energy service, the, um, uh, dividing the, the energy used, the uh, uh, 72 um, uh, billion um, uh, liters, by 
uh, the energy service provided, which is the 905 uh, billion uh, car kilometers. And that gives us a value of eight liters per 100 kilometer, or if we want to keep it in the energy notation, 80 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. And we'll use that as a reference. So that's the average consumption for average cars in an average society, well, in 2010, it hasn't changed that much uh, uh, since, since then. So um, now we can do more efficiently. Uh, there are cars with thermal combustion engines, uh, which are much more efficient than uh, the average. Uh, this is a new car. Um, I don't have to mention who is uh, producing it. So, uh, all, all the car uh, producers uh, don't uh, are not very different in that respect. Uh, in this modern car, we have uh, four and a half liters diesel of 100 kilometers, or 45 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, which is only 56 percent of the average consumption. Yeah, so we already see that also uh, within traffic, there can be uh, different efficiencies, uh, whether we need a lot of energy or we need less of energy for the same energy service. But we can do even better. This is a demonstration car, uh, which has been shown by VW, um, uh, the so-called uh, low energy car one, uh, which uses only 1.38 liter of gasoline uh, per 100 kilometers, or 13.8 uh, kilowatt hours uh, per 100 uh, uh, kilometers, which is only 70% of what we use in average in, an, uh, in the, uh, the current uh, situation in uh, Germany. Uh, it was not never brought to the market. You might discuss with uh, VW what. Uh, happened there? Well, we somehow know what, what happened there. But is that is that the efficiency we can get to? Is there a limit how efficient we can go? Well, let's look at cycling. Uh, with cycling, well, you have to take some breakfast yeah, to, to go for cycling. And uh, now you can calculate how much energy do you need uh, uh, for going 100 kilometers, and it turns out it's uh, about two and a half kilowatt hours. Um, uh, that is only 3% of the energy we, knew, we use in average uh, for the um, uh, traffic, the average traffic uh, we do in our society. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a huge factor. Now, is that a question of velocity? So, this is what comes into mind. This is a question of velocity. No! It's not mainly a question of velocity, but of technology. So if we are at a fixed technology, it's a question of velocity. That's true. But if we use improved technology, like bicycle technology, also for the car, this is the Sunkreiser. This is a car which was built by students of the University of Bochum with a specific energy consumption of 2.3 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, even lower than the, than the um, uh, bicycle. Uh, that's only 2.9% 2, 2 of, the, of the energy uh, in uh, contemporary cars we use on the street. Uh, and this is going 100 kilometers per, per hour. So, uh, yeah, it's not a question of velocity. It's, a, it's mainly a question of uh, technology. So, and uh, the surprising thing here is, um, well, if you look into that very much deeper, from the point of view of physics, again, you're going back to Galilei here. Uh, Galilei asked himself what would be the fastest path for uh, a body uh, going uh, from a point A on the left-hand side to a point B on the right-hand side, if it's starting with a starting velocity, uh, zero, uh, uh, the zero. Um, and most people think, well, the shortest path, that would be the fastest one. For most people, it's very surprising that that's not true. The brachistochrone, the way of fastest traffic from point A to point B, is this one. It's the, it's the blue one. Uh, well, surprising, isn't it? Yeah, what's happening here? If we look at the body at a certain place, you see the body who is going up here, it has almost the same constant 
velocity. You can try that with, with your bicycles, always the same constant velocity. Uh, and uh, so it will take some time to come from A to B. Uh, but the body taking uh, the blue path, uh, it will be falling down, powered by the Earth's gravitational energy. It will transform Earth's gravitational in energy into, into what? Kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy is not just uh, vertical, it's also partly horizontal. So the body will be faster at this point by the energy gained from the Earth's gravitational field than up there. It's always faster. It's faster here, even faster here, fastest at the bottom. Now you say, oh, and then you go back and you go slower again. Yes, of course, you go slower again. But you are still faster than, uh, than one on top here. Uh, until the very end, where at the very end you are back to velocity from the beginning, um, you have returned all the energy. See that? You have returned, you have recycled all the energy to Earth's gravitational field. Nothing lost, no energy losses. Yeah. We just used the energy conversion into kinetic energy to have higher velocity at that point. And then we give back that energy to the gravitational field until we are on that place again. So for traffic, the energy really needed again is zero. Well, I will know. There's some problem here. The problem here is that we have energy losses. Yes, of course, we have friction, for example. Uh, uh, but when we are back to what I told you at the beginning, all the energy we use today is just compensated for losses. In this respect here, for the, for the traffic, it's the friction losses. So friction losses. And uh, well, if you yeah, uh, just look at it in that way, if you sit in your car, uh, you accelerate the car by putting the gasoline pedal, uh, then you get a kinetic energy. And now there is a red light. Now you have to stop. What do you do? Yeah, you, 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 you take the brakes. What does the brake do? Well, the brake just transforms again the energy, the kinetic energy into heat, heat energy. The brake will get hot. Yeah, you very well know that. It can even create problems. And, and this heat at the end will be uh, distributed uh, uh, to the environment. So it's the same like with the building. We, we, it's, it's just losses. What we produce at the end is losses and only losses. Let's take another example uh, from lighting. Also showing that we make a lot of progress in that respect. Uh, when we started, uh, as human beings in in uh, uh, in a first civilization, uh, we had nothing else than candles uh, to light. But candles have very low efficiency for producing light. It's only 0.1 lumen per watt. So in order to have the light you are used to in your office right now, that is 700 lumen, you would need 7,000 watts. Oh, some almost impossible to do that with uh, with candles without uh, burning your office. Um, the next thing was a pressurized mantle lamp that, that was still producing light from fuel. But the efficiency was 50 times higher, 50 lumen per watt, so it would be sufficient to have 140 watt, which is still a lot uh, a big amount of energy. It's also uncomfortable because it's getting hot. And it's also uncomfortable because it's smelly and so on. So, well, it was a big progress when uh, the incandescent bulb came up, which has already 12 lumen per watt. This is 12 times, no, uh, it's uh, 100, 120 times more efficient than the candle. So we are at the 60 watts uh, light bulb, which is still what most people think uh, uh, the energy source uh, is in, 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 in their minds. Later on, we realized that we can have uh, light producing processes which are much more efficient than an incandescent lamp, like the compact fluorescent lamp you see here, which has 60 lumen per watt, five times that of the incandescent bulb, and we are down to 12 watts. Now we have seen that uh, with semiconductor technology, uh, we can do even better. Uh, with an LED light, and now it has been improved to double of that. That was the best case, 2019, but uh, well, still not the physical optimum. Physical optimum would be 200 lumens per watt, and 
uh, surprise what? We reached that in 2022. We are now down to three and a half of what, uh, what we need to provide the energy for having comfortable light in your office, which is 99.9% .9 less than the energy which was used a couple of centuries before. So the efficiency improvement is a huge contribution, uh, maybe the biggest pro contribution uh, to, com to the comfort uh, we have now in our uh, societies. Uh, let's go to the next example. You might already be tired to see all these examples. Information technology, communication, that's two and a half percent of the total final energy. It's not that much that a lot of people always talk about. It's not that bad that you do a Google search, not a big thing. But yes, um, well, where is the energy consumed for? Well, uh, most of it is going to displace. Uh, so in a conventional display, we had these old ones, the not efficient, old, uncomfortable technology, which is about 80 watts uh, for displaying uh, the uh, information on the screen, which is huh, yeah, yeah, uncomfortable. It's a big one. It's getting hot. It's uh, emitting x-rays. So, so on the right-hand side, you see what we normally use nowadays. That's a so-called uh, LCD display. Uh, which only consumed 20 watts a couple of years ago, but now the modern ones, the really improved ones, are at a range of 10 watts. So it's an efficient, new, more comfortable technology using only one eighth of the energy we used early on. Is that already the best possible efficiency we can provide? No. There is an emerging technology, electronic paper, electronic ink. This Technology doesn't need any energy to display. Well, it's the same like in a book. The printed letter doesn't, doesn't need any energy uh, uh, to provide the information. Only printing it will do so. Or here, if we change the display, uh, it will need a little bit of energy uh, to change the orientation of these small spheres which are inside of such a uh, display. So now uh, the energy consumed is negligible. It's, it's, it's almost nothing. Uh, so we, we could have huge screens uh, with electronic paper or with electronic ink without consuming a lot of energy. I stopped with the examples here. Uh, you would be very tired to see that almost everything, uh, if you look into the processes, almost everything we do nowadays, is uh, of that kind and uh, this is what I promised at the beginning of my presentation. Now can we make use of that uh, of that knowledge? Uh, yes we can. Uh, what we see here is uh, the primary energy use in Germany uh, over the last uh, 30 years. We started at about uh, 15,000 Peter Joule uh, per year and well it's been reduced. We, we now have 10% uh, less primary energy consumption than we had in 1990. Whilst uh, the services have been increased, uh, we can measure it by the, uh, the gross product uh, of, of a country. Uh, we now have more buildings heated. We have more uh, a square meter per person. We are driving more and faster in our cars. Uh, so we have higher energy services and uh, the energy services has been increased quite a lot in that time. But the total energy amount which we need from non-renewable sources has been reduced. So uh, minus 28% in that time for non-renewable energy consumption, that's something. Between 2003 and 2018, 15 years, it corresponds to 2% less energy each year. Well, it would take 50 years to be completely uh, away from fossil fuels. Uh, but, well, of course, we can continue that com commitment and we can do even better. Uh, but that's also important that we talk about that success. It's a success. And we need a positive communication about that success. And we should do even better than that. Uh, we can improve this efficiency introduction. And this was part of my presentation, the very first presentation 
uh, in, in that um, lecture uh, series uh, we have here at the University of Innsbruck. So how can we implement that in the existing economy? That's also quite easy. Uh, if we have a product, for example, a window produced by a producer, the producer can come up with an idea how to improve that component with respect to energy efficiency. Then clever engineers can evaluate that, that um, design of a new component, can look whether the criteria and efficiency are met, and if yes, we can certify that product. If no, we can give some advice to the producer how he can improve his product. And this loop might be going through three times, five times, but at the end, we almost in any case get to a product which is at least 50% um, more efficient uh, than the old one was. Uh, so we have a lot of these successful certifications. So by the development of these improved products, this is where engineers uh, come in. This is where our know-how is needed. And this has spread globally. So these are examples of buildings built uh, by these principles uh, everywhere on planet Earth, uh, from Australia to uh, Northern Canada, uh, to uh, the uh, South uh, Antarctic uh, 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 station. Uh, built as buildings with these very low energy uh, demands, which are possible by increasing energy efficiency. So this is a successful development. I'll give you at the end some hints for further information. There's one paper which has just come out uh, by Innsbruck University Press about can we heat with a simple single room split HVAC uh, uh, system. Huh? Interesting to look at that. This has just been published at uh, Innsbruck University um, uh, Press, uh, which is uh, giving some information about measurements uh, we have done uh, in the past couple of years. When we have a new campaign, Efficiency No, uh, which is how we can reduce the gas dependency fast by improving efficiency, for example, uh, insulating the ducts and so on. Uh, and you will find all that um, on a internet page called Passipedia, www.passipedia.org. There's also a QR code here where you can come to these pages in Passipedia and uh, you'll get updated information here uh, uh, every, every few days. So, uh, we still in our society have not efficient, old, low comfort technology, but we can change that, going to energy efficiency. And I want to thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Wolfgang Feist. Thank you. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions feel free to um, type them in the chat or just ask uh, directly also the audience <laughs> in the lecture hall uh, if you have any any questions well maybe one first question from from my side so um uh, would you have some uh, suggestions how to um put it into practice because um in your first slides you showed that the um, system at the, at the moment is to deal with energy carriers, with energy. So we um, make money from selling energy. But if you uh, convert to uh, the system you described, uh, dealing with energy services um, and um, taking money for the service, not for the energy, we could uh, uh, can make it in a different way. So where it's already realized is in um, transport. For example, public transport takes money for a train ticket uh, for kilometers and persons of uh, transport. Um, you don't pay for the electricity for of the train, <laughs> you pay for the kilometers uh, of transport. Uh, so how could we um, 
uh, think this further in, in our society, in, in other um, kind of um, energy um, services, or not only transport. I think in transport, it's already good uh, realized. Well, I just have to contradict. Um, this doesn't solve a problem, Rainer, because the efficiency of a public transport system is also very bad. Uh, uh, so the real part that's really uh, important is at, at that point where the systems for the use of energy are being produced. And this is what I showed here. Uh, that is, uh, the guys who are producing windows, they are uh, in, in some kind defining how inefficient our system is. So if we have a if we have a um, incentive uh, that uh, people producing windows uh, have a incentive to produce better windows, this would change the system. So this would uh, bring a part of the economy from uh, the providers of energy of fuel uh, to the people uh, producing higher efficiency products like windows. Or it's uh, the same with uh, with traffic here. So if uh, there is a clever a clever uh, producer who might provide, say, a very efficient public um, transportation system uh, like a cable car, cable cars are very efficient. Um, so so these would be the solutions as long as the public uh, transport uh, will use the same kind of inefficient technologies as as we do normally, uh, like a uh, fuel-driven buses or things like that, it, 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 it won't help very much. Huh? So uh, the important thing is to improve the technology and to have um, to have incentives for the producers of that technology. The producers of the technology, they are the ones who, um, who, who give us the lock-in uh, situation in the existing system. And we have also to be aware of that. But uh, we have that lock in. So if, if a, uh, say, public transport guy buys a new bus, he will have to use that bus for the next 20 or 40 years. Otherwise, he, he has, it, it's, a, it's a lost investment. It's a lost asset. So this is the way how the energy consumption is stabilized in our society, yeah? just by uh, uh, making us buy all these inefficient products all the time. Ever, ever, ever again. So that is how to change that. To have uh, incentives for improving the efficiencies of the products. But the um, transport provider um, earns more money if um, he has um, to spend less for the energy. So um, uh, it's a self uh, um, improving system because um, the more efficient the, the bus or the train is, um, the less the expenses are. So um, it should be self um, optimizing. So, same with, yeah, with dwellings. It's interesting what you say, it should be. So, why isn't it? That's the question. <laughs> think about <laughs> it. Think, think about it. Why, why isn't it? Um, it's a, yeah, it's a good question. And uh, well, we, we can discuss about it for, for a long time, but. Uh, uh, we also see that um, the process uh, I discussed here, uh, what you really need is an incentive for the construction of the systems. Yeah, the systems uh, define uh, how high the uh, cons consumption is. So if we have a, a, a system for, say, a improved um, family car using electricity uh, with uh, not so high uh, weight and with a very low uh, air resistance, that could be down to 10 kilowatt hours per uh, 100 kilometers. That's only one eighth of what we consume nowadays. Yeah? So you see, if we improve that system, if you have an incentive for improving that system, which, this, this will give us factors eight or 10 or whatever yeah, for the improvement. And so this is what, 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 what we would have to look for. And this is what, uh, already, uh, some people realized. Yeah? So, European Commission, for example, yeah? they realized that that we we have to look for the efficiency of the systems. Yeah, maybe um, up to now it's not happening this um, self-optimizing system because we have a mixture between those uh, selling of services but also selling of energy. And maybe at the moment the selling of energy 
uh, energy carriers are stronger than the energy service providers. Um, so we don't have this economy which is only based on services. Maybe this would help if um, it's not possible to sell energy, but sell um, yeah, um, efficiency, um, uh, selling the service um, only. Yeah? Warm houses or, or kilometers, um, person transport or whatever. <laughs> so maybe if, if um, economy is changed in this way, it could help. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's an idea that was brought up by Eco Institute quite 30 years ago. Uh, we could discuss it for a long time. Uh, one of the problems here is that uh, when you think about it, fossil fuel energy is still very cheap. Still now, it's very cheap. Uh, so the incentive uh, to uh, reduce uh, uh, the energy needed is very low. Uh, and um, the same people who, uh, if you look at a provider like uh, like a city, uh, they might also earn money from selling fossil fuels, still. And they might earn more money from selling uh, fossil fuels uh, than uh, these uh, processes you discussed right now. That, 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 that's the problem behind that. Yeah. So, so uh, fossil fuel energy it was, was seen to be very cheap. Now it, now that changed, that's changing at the moment, but it was seen to be very, very cheap. So we forgot about all the other problems we have with the energy because we don't pay for these problems. Yeah, not yet. Future generations will pay for it. So we make others pay for the, the problems we create. Yeah, so any but, questions? But it's, not, it's, but it's not that frustrating. So this is why I always insist in looking at this from another point. If we have incentives for those who are producing the systems, producing the cars, producing the windows and so on, to improve their systems, we can uh, do that process, as I have shown. Yeah? It's already shown that it's working. It's working, but we need some incentives for those people who produce uh, the cars, the bicycles, the windows, yeah? mm -hmm. in order to improve the technological efficiency of these systems and we can do so by a factor of four or five or ten and this is what's working there's a question in the audience Did you understand the question, or should I repeat? Uh, no, no, there's too much echo. Mm. Uh, okay, so um, could you switch off the? Um, I'll just repeat the the question. The the question is about um, the um, gray energy, the inbuilt energy of uh, products. For example, a window, if it's um, still um, rather new, and then you throw it away and build in a new one. Um, it takes some energy for production, and the question is: Is there some break-even point? Or when may I change the window, or when is the energy inbuilt in the product higher than the savings? I think that was the, the question. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's of course a, a very important question. Um, uh, think of it in, in a completely different way. That is, this building uh, you see here, it's being built anyhow. It's not being built because you want to build an energy efficient building. It's been built because people need dwellings. So this is built anyhow. Now we add a bit of insulation. Now you can calculate for the energy input for that insulation. And we've done that, of course. Yeah. And it turns out that it takes less than one year. It's about half a year. But even with conventional insulation materials, this energy is being paid back by the energy saved by the material. 
So no problem here, not at all. Now for the renovation, of course, if you just exchanged the window last year to another double pane window, well, that's your problem, yeah? Uh, that was a mistake, of course. Yeah? You should have used a better window, but well, okay, now it's another 30 years, but after 30 years, you will exchange a window again, anyhow. And now you use a better window, uh, improved window, it has one pane more. You can calculate for the gray energy in that one pane. Turns out that's even less. That's uh, uh, a month of energy worth of energy losses here. Yeah. So um, if we do it in a proper way, and there's no danger, nobody who just installed a new window will now just throw it away because he wants a more energy efficient one. It's far too expensive. That's not going on. What what What's the path to go is every time you build in a new window, that's the time where the alarm clock should go on. New window. Now it's time to use the better one. The better one is only, say, 50 euro or 100 euro more expensive. That doesn't matter if it's 600 or 700 euro window. It will pay back um, uh, uh, on the uh, monetary scale in uh, five to six years, but it will pay back on the energy scale in, in just uh, half the first heating period. So it's always worth to do that, always worth to do that. And of course, the only mistake you can do is if you build new or if you refurbish a building, still going to be old inefficient solutions, which is mostly been done. Yeah? So, so, so that's a problem here. So um, the energy efficiency comes with almost no additive uh, environmental impact, even if we use uh, conventional materials. And the uh, question was also about um, refurbishing. Um, so um, what you're told now is um, if you add some insulation or change the windows to better ones, um, uh, then it's only a small amount of um, uh, additional or um, better materials. So um, what first question always raised is uh, what's the difference between um, um, demolishing the building and uh, building it uh, new. That's a different question because there's a, a lot of um, uh, energy inbuilt in concrete and building materials for the statics for the building itself. Um, there, the, the difference is um, higher, um, but um, with only the refurbishing parts, changing parts or adding insulation, um, it's just as you're, you're told, it's um, one year or even less in uh, some components yeah. exactly exactly uh, so uh, visible comes out there of course it's always worth uh, to think about whether you can still um, continue to use an existing building mm, important thing refurbish it and continue to use well nowadays we have that discussion about continue to use and a lot of people think well that's the best way to go no you have to refurbish it. You have to improve the efficiency because it has a very, very, very poor efficiency. These old buildings, yeah? 200 kilowatt hours per square meter a year, this is far too much. So we have to refurbish that building. This is what has been done, for example, with the, with the um, uh, building uh, of the technical department of the University of Innsbruck, yeah? just demonstrating that. That had to be refurbished anyhow. There were reasons why it had to be refurbished. It was not just refurbished out of fun or to save energy. That never works. It had to be refurbished because the balconies were breaking down. Uh, the, the windows were not working any longer and so on. So it had to be refurbished. But uh, the quality to refurbish it, uh, that was a bit different to the quality which would have used without the influence of the Department of Building Physics. So the Department of Building Physics, the Institute, they, they, they gave some advice how to do, how to improve that. And, and that device that cost at, at the end 10% more than the normal refurbishment, but at the end, the overall energy consumption was reduced by, well, Rainer Pluge, you might know how, how much it was reduced. So um, uh, this is the way uh, this is working. Uh, yes, of course, it takes some time. Well, it also took some time to come to the current situation with that tremendous high fossil fuel consumption. And uh, it will take not as long, but it will take some time uh, to go step by step through all these systems to substitute them again to better efficiency systems. But it can be done because 
all these refurbishment steps, they will have to be done anyhow. And it's only a question whether you go still to the old inefficient technology, so the old uh, window with a double pane and with just an uninsulated frame and with an aluminium spacer, or if you go to the better new technology with only half or a quarter of that uh, energy losses. The university building is a good example because it's really um, flexible in use. It's made of um, concrete columns and slabs. So there are no static walls. Um, you can choose them as you want with light white uh, walls and you can use it uh, within the next uh, 50 years uh, without problems. It's so flexible um, and comfortable now um, with the insulation. Uh, so it will have a prolonged life of 50 years or more. Um, yeah, that's that's a good, good example. Yeah, any other questions from the, from the audience? Or from the online participants, you can use the mic or type in the in the chat. About this um, efficiency characterization, why is it energy consumption by energy service and not the other way around? So it would be proportional uh, high efficiency with high uh, numbers. <laughs> um, what was the reason for turning it around? Could you explain? Yeah, well, this is... Um, uh, it, it, this is um, the, for example, let's look at the at the heating here again. Uh, if we go to optimal efficiency, uh, that is a building which is insulated as good as you can with uh, even better windows than we normally do right now. How high the heating demand will be? Yeah, zero will be zero. Uh, so if we divide in the opposite direction, uh, there will be no value provided. Uh, so as long as you have an energy service, it's not zero. Uh, so we, um, uh, it, it, there will ne never be a division by zero. Uh, so this okay. is why, okay. uh, this is why um, this kind of factor, this is a utilization factor or something like that, is the better is a better way than the efficiency. At the end, mm -hmm. Any, anyhow, yeah, anyhow. But of course, it's it's so that that here it's getting better and better the lower the value goes. Yeah? So the lower values are the better values here. It only had mathematical reasons so to also describe um, the the zero value or the close to zero. Yeah. Yeah, it's just be if if you make uh, the if you make one divided by this, you'll you'll uh, arrive at a kind of efficiency factor again. No? Mm -hmm. okay. as, as long as, as long as it's not zero. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, if there are no further questions, I don't see them in the in the audience or in the in the chat. I think. I would say thank you very much for the presentation and the interesting thank explanations. Thank and hopefully we will have more efficiency in the future and less yeah. energy in, in terms of gas or coal or whatever. <laughs> thank you very much and goodbye. Have a nice weekend. Yeah. See you. Bye. Goodbye.